Okay, <clears throat> on the camshafts, the big lobes with a flat section are the closers and the lobes in the middle are the openers. It's the closing rocker. So what happens is in the cam, it sits like that. Closing rocker just follows around. It pulls the valve up. The opening rocker sits on the cam like so and goes up and down. So that's where they run. When we try and push the camshaft, pull a, push the valve down and then hold the rocker down, we put something through underneath the bottom of the rocker and that will be when it's on the base, on the lifted section so that allows it to move up and that allows us to work with the valve down. It's much easier. Yep. Okay, so now we're going to pull the closing shim out. Now to do that, we need to hold the closing rocker down so we can physically get the shim out of the way and get the collets out. Uh, it's one of those things that people have a lot of various ways of doing. A lot of them seem very convoluted and amazingly hard to me. So the easy ways to do it, these are a couple of things. This is a, a tool that I machined up at a fitting and turning course years ago based on another tool we used to use, which was just a punch. This is made to hold down closing rockets. That's all its job ever was. Or alternatively, a piece of aluminium tube works just as well. So the first thing we do is lift the opening shim off. Don't mix them up. Now we just push the valve down and you'll need to make sure it's on the the open part of the cam. So we push the valve down, take our tool and slide it through next to the valve on the side that doesn't have the spring on it as the closing spring here. These things have closing springs, uh, which is just a helper spring to make them idle. So the pin goes on the other side. At that point of time, the valve is now free because the closing rocker is held down. Now again, people use all sorts of methods to hold the valve up that don't make any sense at all to me. Um, the easiest way to do it because we've got the belts off and realistically you just cannot do this with the belts on. Another point, if you're going to do this with the belts on, just go and do something else. You're wasting your time. So we turn the engine over now till the piston comes up and you'll see the top of the valve come up. There it is. And down again. At the moment, like that, the valve is sitting on top of the piston. So the, pist the valve can't fall into the cylinder. It can't go anywhere. It's just the easiest way to do it. Now we lift the collets out. The collets are two half circular pieces of wire. We try and take them out so we keep the orientation the way that they were. That's the collet. It's tiny. With my eyes these days, I have trouble seeing them. And I'll probably draw a picture at some point to show you what you're looking for in terms of where. So I lift the collets out the way they were. Usually you can see the wear, you might need a magnifying glass or some, some strong glasses, um, but that's, they need to go back in the way they came out or, you, or anything you do is not consistent at all. And that's the closing shim out. And then we have to measure the closing shim and work out what we're going to do to replace it. Uh, I probably should have gone back a step with this. There's two ways of doing the valve clearances in terms of adjustment or measuring adjustment. I personally feel it, and then I go to my shim collection. I have hundreds of shims, which makes it really easy. A lot of people use a method called loaded and unloaded clearance, and that basically means you measure the clearance with the valve closed and the, on the opening clearance, and then you push the rocker down, and then you measure that clearance, and the opening clearance minus the loaded clearance is the closing clearance. And that's one way of doing it. If you don't have a whole lot of shims, you have to order shims, whatever. That's a way of doing it to get you in the ballpark. Um, this whole procedure can be a little bit inconsistent at times. And it also depends quite a bit on the measuring tool you're using. If somebody rings me up and says, I need some shims, and they're going to come in, I say bring either your shims or your measuring tool because your tool might measure differently to mine. If it does, and you ask for a... 6.8, I'll give you a 6.8 on my tool, but it might be a 6.75 or a 6.85 or more on your tool. So that's one thing to be aware of. The tools can be quite inconsistent because for a closing shim, you need to measure onto the radius down in there that the collets sit on. So I'll put this back in. 
and I'll show you the, the loaded, unloaded system. I can do 8mm ones with gloves on, I can't do 7mm ones with gloves on. I tend to start dropping the collets. So I move the piston down so I can push the valve down again. <coughs> Put the opening shim back on, slide the rocker across. Now the loaded, unloaded system only works if there is opening clearance. If there's no opening clearance, it's not going to work because you need to measure the difference between that and when you push the rocker down, the closing rocker down. So that's the opening clearance. The best time to measure the clearance on this side is when, which is the inlet, is when the exhaust is just starting to push the valve down. So we get the exhaust one on, which we can't do because there's no opening clearance. Let the shim out, just push the rocker across. When you see that the exhaust opening robe starts to move down, that's when we check the inlet because that usually means the inlet is on the center of the base circle or roundabout. It's the easiest way to do it. Um, none of this needs to happen at top dead center. The actual top dead center on this cylinder is when the timing mark is about there. But I do it when the valves, the <coughs> opposite valve is rocking, what people say. I'll go and grab some, some fuel gauges. Okay, so what we're doing now is just measuring the clearances. So the first clearance we measure is the opening clearance between the opening rocker and the opening shim at the top. It should be about 0.1 of a mil. Go okay, 0.1. 0.125. With the feeler gauges, the feeler gauges for metric are all 0.1, 0.125, or 0.13, 0.15, 0.1, 75, 0.2, but realistically they're all in foul. Each, each increment for all the gauges is one thou. So 0.1 of a millimetre is four thou, 0.15 is six thou. So work in whichever one works best for you, but realistically all your increments on your feeler gauges are going to be one thou. It's the general rule. So just put the gauge in until you get drag, there's a touch of drag there, that's a uh, seven thou or point one eight-ish, yeah, and a point two has got definite drag. So that's point one eight on the unloaded clearance, and now we load it. So we push the rocker down, don't push too hard. Sometimes you can't really feel it move. Um, sometimes you'll feel a definite click, 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 click. I can't really feel that now, but you just load the rocker down. This is a point two three or nine thou, it goes in. 0.25 or 10 thou, goes in, 0.27 or 11 thou, and that's almost tight. So if we had 7 thou on the opening and nearly 11 thou on the closing, let's say we've got 4 thou or 0.1 of a mil on the closing clearance. So we'll go for a shim that's point one of a millimetre bigger on the closer and the opener, which is 0.18 or so, and I want 0.1, so I go 0 0.08 bigger on that one as well. Opener. Let's turn the engine over till the piston comes up, holds the valve up, push it down. Pull the collets out. <clears throat> Sometimes the valve, the closing shims can be hard to get out because the collets have worn a burr on the valve stem at the top of the collet groove. Um, you may need to get in there with a little file and file it off on extreme cases. Otherwise, you can you can often lever it off and it'll sort of pull the burr off as the as the shim comes off. But that's not uncommon on high kilometer or uh, poorly maintained engines, or even some valves. I think I've used some of the valves I've used have appeared to be more prone to it than others. So now we go and measure the shims. Okay, this is a uh, 
the tool that I use for measuring the shims. Um, I don't know if it's an official Ducati tool or not. Um, I've got a couple of versions of it. These little feet have been rounded to work, but again, any inconsistency in the rounding will make a difference to how they actually measure from tool to tool. The original shim in here is a 6.53. Um, I have found in the past, using the loaded unloaded method, that it, I seem to get a bigger measurement for the closing clearance than it actually is. So I'm going to try a 6.61 and we'll see how that goes. This is very much a, a trial and error process, even if everything should work. Never assume that it will. Um, but the two valves are much more consistent than the four valves in my experience. And I, I think some of the issues I used to have with inconsistency were somewhat based on measuring tools not being as accurate to the form they needed to be. And so old shims would measure differently to new shims, that sort of thing. So piston down, tool out, then we turn the camshaft over. And if the camshaft, so if the camshaft grabs, that's drag and you can feel there's drag starts there and it drags all the way around to there. So that's basically from there to there is dragging which is the, the base circle of the closing lobe. So that shim's a little bit too big. Probably about 0.1 of a mil given that it's very minimal drag but there's drag there. I'd rather have no drag but no clearance so I'll make it a shim a little bit thinner. Just dropped the collet, so I'll need to put the strong glasses on and work out which way it was in. Six six one. Oh, okay. So this time I'm going to try shim at six point five nine, so point zero two smaller than the previous, and this should eliminate all that drag that I could feel. I need to <clears throat> put my strong glasses on and look at this collet. What you're looking for is a wear pattern. Uh, there's a wear pattern on the inside at the top and on the outside at the bottom. Often you can see it right on the very corner if it's hard to see elsewhere, or sometimes the collets can be quite worn and it's really, really obvious where the wear is. And sometimes it's almost as much the difference in light reflected off them you can see as the actual wear appearance. Um, collets need to be really, really worn before I replace them and they do settle in. So if you do decide to change the collets every time it needs a valve adjustment, it will always need adjusting because the collets will settle in um, whereas if you leave the collets in there, after a couple of adjustments, they should settle down and it'll just it'll be fine. So, piston down, out, turn it over, and there's just a touch. What I sometimes do, the piston's well out of the way, and we're off the base circle, is just give the top of the cam, the valve, a bit of a... to make sure it sits in nicely. There's just a hint of drag just, yeah, it's all the way around. So I'll try a smaller shim. This is why I don't like the loaded, unloaded system to some extent. It, uh, it doesn't, for me, it's not as consistent as I think it should be. Okay, so a slightly smaller shim again. Collet's in. Just do tool out. Uh, 
and that's fine. That's a 6.58. Um, people often talk about being able to spin the shim. Uh, and they do often do that. People who like to leave the belts on talk about being able to spin the shims. Um, the only time I do a spin, a shim spin, is on a bevel drive. On a bevel drive, because it has shafts here and bevel gears, you can't undrive the cams easily, for a better term. I can't think of the word I should have used then. Um, so realistically, on a bevel drive, you can't turn the camshaft to feel the drag. So you try and spin the shim. If you can spin the shim easily, then it usually means they're fine and there's no, there's no movement. Why don't we move it around to the base circle? Oh, there you go. You can hear noise all the way around, which is often <laughs> what happens. You might have only changed a tiny difference in the shim, but you can sort of... Uh, there's heaps of movement there. Yep, inconsistency again. So either the shim I had in previously was no good, or this shim is no good. Sometimes I find this and often I, I have a lot of changeover shims. I often throw changeover shims in a recycling if they just look like they've got wacky wear patterns or something on them. Let's try another one. I'll try this one. <clears throat> so as far as using the, the spin method to assess the clearance, um, if it's really tight, you won't be able to spin the shim, but it's pretty much useless apart from that, in my experience. I wouldn't use being able to turn the shim as any sort of measurement, realistically. It's just not practical at all, in my opinion, unless you're doing a bevel drive, in which case I tend to sneak up on the clearance to get rid of the clearance progressively, and then when I find it's all gone, if I can spin the shim, I'm happy. So turning the cam around now, we get it up onto the base circle. Can't feel anything, can't hear anything. It's amazing how small a clearance you can hear, but there's no drag. So that is done. Easy. Now the opener was about 0.18 mil, so we want to take it down to 0.1. It's near the shim, that's 0 0.08 bigger. And usually closing, usually opening shims are much more consistent than closing shims, and much easier to measure. This one is 2.85, and so we'll go try and find a 2.93 or so. It's a 2.92. Sometimes you tend to overshoot, so I often try and uh, just stick with creeping up on the clearance instead of going direct there. Sometimes on a four valve, if you have really big clearances, on the closers, if you try and go all the way in one hit, you'll overshoot pretty regularly. Okay, so that one's in. I'll try the point one. One three. Okay, there's enough drag on the point one three. That makes me happy to call that point one. So that's the clearance is done on that one. I've got to do the exhaust still. Um, that's it. It's pretty simple. It's very confusing. The first time I did it was at a training course. The next time I had to do it a few weeks later, I just stood there and looked at it for a while. I'd completely forgotten how to do it. But do it a few times. It's pretty simple. Um, there's not many things you can do wrong. If you get the collets mixed up, that can cause you inconsistency. Uh, the tool you use to measure the shims can cause you inconsistency. But realistically, the ultimate test is if you can spin the cam and there's no drag, that's good. And you want no movement in the valve as well. And that's basically it. And the openers, some people like using 0 0.08, some people like using 0.1 or 0.125. 3,000 to 5,000, it's not going to make much difference really on the actual result you get. It's all going to run pretty well. I don't like going less than 0.1 or 4 thou personally. Um, but on these 
older engines, it's fairly rare to see a really tight valve, like a really tight opener. Um, usually they just all get a bit loose over time. Uh, because there's no clearance on the opener on this side, measure the shim. The shim is a 4.1, which isn't that big. So I can either just take a guess and put a smaller shim in, or you can just get your feeler gauges and get a few out and find out. Once again, turn the camshaft until you see the opening, the inlet valve starting to move. That's when you check the exhaust. So that stack fits. That stack fits. That doesn't fit. Okay. And that is about 3.6. So we'll get a shim that's about 3.6 and give that a go. Okay. 3.56 millimeters. Oops. Dropped it. Now it's all oily. And now we can, I usually like to turn them, whenever I put a shim in, just turn the cam over just to seat everything and then rotate the cam till the inlet starts to move. And I can measure the ex exhaust opener. Point one, just a rough measurement. Oh, point two. Two five. That's point two five. And now on this side, the cams must be very similar in the base circle because there really isn't any movement that you can hear. And certainly, I'll move the inlet opener across. There's no drag, so that, that one is, by luck more than anything else, is fine. So I don't need, don't need to adjust that closer. That's 0.25 with that shim on the opener. So I need another 15, 56, about 3.71. When I went to the US about three or so years ago now, I went to visit Nick Larson at Valley Desmo in, in LA and I am forever jealous of Nick's valve shim organisation. I must say, every time I do it, I think of Nick's shim organisation and I am annoyed with myself, but clearly not, not annoyed enough to do anything about my organisation. So that shim, point one. I just spin the shims around. Sometimes you get a bit of variation as you, as the shim turns. Okay, it's about 0.13. It's often a little petty to chase a number that small, but I figure that if I'm in here and adjusting it, I might as well make it exactly what I want it to be. And that's got drag on it, so I'll call that point one. And that's the valve clearance is done. Um, I've done it a lot of times. It's very easy. It's quite daunting the first time, but it's really a very simple job. And as long as you don't drop anything, one thing to be aware of, on these heads, there's oil drain back holes. And the oil drain back holes are in here, on the exhaust side on the vertical, and there's one on the inlet just here and those holes go down to the size of the cylinders and down the size of the cylinders into the sump. Um, you can drop collets down there, some people block them up with, some people use valve cover screws, put them in the holes and that blocks the hole up so you can't drop a collet. Um, I've never dropped a collet down a hole but if you're worried about it, 
it's one more thing to certainly attend to. Um, if you're paranoid, it's a good thing to just block the hole. Don't forget to take it out though before you put the covers on. That's why you use valve cover screws. So you don't put the covers on without it. Now once we've done that, we just need to make sure that there's a steel shim on either side of the clip. We get our clip. There's little shims in here and there needs to be one each side, one against the head, one against the rocker. And then we just slide the clip in. That's the clip back on. With the clips on, it does load the opening rocker a bit. So I always pull the clips out before doing any sort of adjustment. And that because it does, it does make a difference to how freely the rocker moves. Um, again, you know, it's one of those things. Some people do this with the belts on and the clips on, and really, I think you're just wasting your time. So that's done. Now we're going to put the belts back on and set the belt tension and then do the cam timing.